Hi, this is Pete's Wolf. And I'm Tender Loving Cares. And you're listening to the second season of Horn Grief or More. The podcast about fetism from the community. And by the community. We had a small little break last week because we were preparing for this very episode and you'll see why in just a second because as you guys know we have usually two episodes per month that are being hosted by Pizza Wolf and by me on different topics and we usually have another two episodes that are kind of more on the experimental side where we try different things within the fetism spectrum of like topics but also what kind of formats we can have. This time, we're going to start off a little mini-series, which is called Audio Smut. And what this is going to be all about is that we've had this idea for a little while that we wanted to look at weight gain fiction stories and maybe having a reading of them. And we've been talking to a few authors of the community, and we have a few stories that we've been given the rights to very generously to read their stories. So yeah, yeah, it's it it's definitely um and we've you know before we recorded this episode we did have a chance to record the actual stories themselves. Um it was a little bit more embarrassing. We were sort <laughs> of kind of worried the last couple of weeks maybe we were taking our podcast in a kinkier direction, but the response has been really great. Mm-hmm. Um we're really happy to hear back from uh those of you who we did hear back from. Um so we we're throwing caution to the wind and going to kind of try what is really a a sort of uh, underutilized method of communicating fetus kink content to the world. You know, we've, we've seen tons of uh, fetus weight gain, fat sex, whatever stories. Uh, there's a bunch of videos, uh, dr- drawings, and of course oh, yeah. people make collages with, with uh, photographs and pictures. There's 3D renderings, videos. Um Am I hitting everything? I mean, people make like padding video, <laughs> padding videos, eating videos, um, you know, still images that that communicate the same thing. Mm-hmm. Animated things, animations. It's a multimedia um, world, yeah. It really is. But one thing that we don't hear too often are uh, audio versions of weight gain stories. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just because you know, well, who needs them? Um, of well, I but, can think of a few people. Including us yeah. as podcast hosts that kind of us enjoy having an audio format out there. Yeah, yeah. Having an audio format <laughs> has been, um, you know, it's really kind of transformed how some of this stuff gets across from mm-hmm. reading it on the screen to hearing some of just a little bit of the playback. Um, I think it's I think it's really, um, really useful and not to not to toot our horn too much, but I think it's pretty hot too. So um, <laughs> We definitely so had fun recording it. Yeah, we definitely did. Um, hopefully, you will think the same. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to include in this episode our first, uh, the first story um, mm-hmm. that we're going to make in this audio smut series. Um, but then we're also going to create a kind of a, a separate playlist within the channel uh, of just the audio files with the stories in them. So you don't need to listen to this introduction. Um, and you don't need to kind of like go through one file that has all the stories. You can just kind of skip and choose, uh, and, and pick where you want. Now mm-hmm. everyone will just immediately turn this episode off and go <laughs> go to the story. Yeah. <laughs> go to that, go to that playlist. Um, exactly. Because the oh. playlist is going to be on YouTube. So if you guys are listening on iTunes or SoundCloud, just take the time. If you want hop onto our YouTube channel, and listen to the first story, which is an amazing story by FFA Boots slash Bacon Pancakes. And it's called Joel's Revelation. But throughout the next week, we'll be uploading a few other stories, it's a little bit shorter, and also from some other authors. So we've been lucky enough, because, um, you know, in the, in the interest of being responsible uh, kink content users, um, one of our policies is we're going to do our best to clear um, all the content that we that we use and and uh, you know appropriate for our podcast. Um, so we were able to reach out to only one so far uh, author, but what an author she is! Um, she writes under uh, FFA Boots and Bacon Pancakes. Those are the two different names she uses. Um, her stuff's been on Dimensions, it's been on Fantasy Feeder, 
Um, it's been posted independently. It's all of it's real good stuff. Um, she also had a story in the third issue of Hungry, the magazine. So, ah, uh, yes, ah, hmm. uh, yes, the magazine format. So, uh, if you've read the the digital magazine, um, then you've also probably um, been familiarized with with Bacon Pancakes' work. We really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll I'll tell you what, in kind of looking at some of this stuff. Um, we had the chance to browse around the internet a little bit. Didn't find too much, but a friend of mine has been recording her own uh, fetus audio inspiration series as well. Over the course of the past year, she puts out uh, an episode every couple months, it seems. And, you know, just kind of little things. They're not super duper long or anything. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention her as kind of somewhat of an inspiration on my end. Um, and, and she posts, uh, and I want to like shout her out as well. She posts, uh, under the name, uh, massively fattening, uh, we'll include links to both her SoundCloud and Mm -hmm. Tumblr. Uh, it's pretty easy. Just soundcloud.com slash massively dash fattening and then massively fattening all one word dot tumblr.com as well. Um, we'll include those, those links there, but those are some, uh, basically they're, they're all from the perspective of a female feeder. They are intentionally gender neutral. So a feedy of uh, either gender or no gender at all mm-hmm. can uh, can listen to them. I think you might have to, the only pronoun you'll have to deal with is piggy, um, <laughs> but, but, but you'll be okay. So, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, so I think that's really our only uh, compatriot out there uh, trying to generate f- specific fetus audio erotica. Mm-hmm. There's there might be a little bit more, but but shout out to Massively Fattening for doing that work. Yeah. And of course, a huge thank you for, to Bacon Pancakes for clearing uh, the the stories that we're going to use to start our burgeoning uh, cache of audio smut online. Exactly, because the stories from Bacon Pancakes as well are also kind of more female feeder, male feed focused right now because that's what she writes and um we felt very comfortable with reading that but we are completely open to reading other stuff in the future or also having guest readers on so if you're a writer and like you've written something you're always welcome to submit stuff hungry magazine at gmail.com if anyone is interested in creating stories for an audio format um you know you could look at writing it in the form of a script understanding that any stage directions wouldn't happen because we can't you know because because it's, it's the radio no it's, mm-hmm. it's it's a podcast it's not quite the radio um <laughs> you know but what's what worked really well was kind of uh changing perspective with uh first person narrators where one person could kind of talk through it on their own um, without having to uh, stitch together like a huge voice cast. I don't think that's something that's within our technical capabilities in terms of both being able to it or wanting to do it particularly. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we, don't, we don't have that type of uh, technical ability. You know, and third-person narrator gets a little bit difficult because uh, we, n- neither of us are third-person. <laughs> we, we are not <laughs> omniscient god figures. So unless, mm-hmm. someone's just, unless we're just going to read the whole thing, um, we we tend to like stuff that we can split up, but you know, obviously we have our likes and dislikes and and the kinks that turn us on within the community. Um, you have yours. Um, you know, if you've written something uh, or want to read something that touches on different stuff, you know, we're we're always willing to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's our podcast, so we get to say no, but you know, it's it, but have have a chat. We're we're friendly and don't bite. Yeah. Unless, of course, you are a cookie, in which case you will be. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that. That's just that's just going to encourage me. That's just going <laughs> to to keep doing. It. All right. Um, Without further ado, then uh, sit back, relax. Um, I would say grab yourself something to eat, mm-hmm. and uh, prepare for the first episode of, or the first, I guess, sub story contained within our. The Hornby for More audio smut series. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is called Joel's Revelation, A Tale in Ten Parts by FFA Boots. My dear, lovely wife Sarah had been taking guitar lessons for months, and I was pleasantly surprised by her ardor for the instrument. She never missed a lesson, and spent hours each night picking out chords, strumming away, singing under her breath. 
It hadn't occurred to me that the draw wasn't so much the music as the teacher. That is, until I overheard a conversation one day between she and her sister Rebecca, who was visiting from Denver. Rebecca is very blunt and loud, and it gets on my nerves. So that day, when she and Sarah came home from shopping, I hid in my basement study, hoping they would assume I was out. But after a few minutes, I heard the pop of a wine cork. Realizing it would be a long, boozy, giggly afternoon, I decided to sneak out to the garage without either of them hearing me. I tiptoed up the stairs and could overhear them chatting. So, are you still taking guitar lessons with that sexy beast? Rebecca asked. I stopped in my tracks. I'd met Sarah's teacher once, and he was an elephantine, red-bearded, barrel-chested guy named Zack. Surely that wasn't who they were talking about. That guy was so big he was like three of me tied together. Sarah giggled. Oh yeah, I don't know if I'm getting any better, but he sure does make a good muse. I mean, I'd never do anything about it, of course. She trailed off wistfully. Of course, but you can look, you're not dead, said Rebecca, and I heard them clink glasses in assent. So, Rebecca continued with a sly edge to her voice, how fat is he? Sarah gasped, huge, but how did you know? Oh, come on, Sarah, what am I, blind? Rebecca hooted, every boyfriend you ever had before Joel was, let's be honest, immense. And remember that rugby guy I dated who gained 50 pounds in the offseason? You took that breakup harder than I did. You, little sister, are a chubby chaser. Ugh, I hate that term, Sarah groaned. It's so glib and stupid. Rebecca sipped her wine. Didn't you tell me that Joel used to be fat at one time, before you met? Yeah, as a teenager. I had always hoped that part of him might, you know, reassert itself. But leave it to me to marry the one ex-fatty who never backslides, Sarah muttered, and I heard her pour another glass of wine. Rebecca snorted with laughter. No, leave it to you to marry a guy who looks like Cary Grant and treats you like a queen and then bitch because he isn't fat enough for you. I know, I know, Sarah said ruefully. What would I have to complain about? He's wonderful. It's just that I've always liked a man with... appetites. Some would say I should have just gotten another guitar teacher. They'd say the second I opened the door to that tiny room in the back of the music store and saw Sex Pillway's stomach resting on his knees, I should have recognized the temptation and left. But instead I fell headlong into a serious crush. Maybe it was inevitable, because he looked nothing like my husband Joel, who was a tall, slim workout nut. Joel is disciplined, old school handsome. He adores me, and we get along extremely well. I simply never brought up that he wasn't exactly my physical type, for fear of seeming shallow or belittling his strict diet and workout regimen. It seemed so important to him. My penance for his deception was the abundance of beautiful huge men I encountered everywhere. At work, on the street, in church, while shopping. They'd stroll by, all rolling breasts and bellies and thighs, and I couldn't touch them. Maddening. So you can imagine what went through my head when I walked into that music school and saw Zach idly tuning a guitar that failed to hide his almost spherical torso. Although I knew it was wrong, I was absurdly attracted to him. I wanted him to drop his guitar, pin me against the wall with his weight and kiss me. Once after a particularly good lesson, he hugged me and I wanted to sing into his cushiony embrace for hours. If you saw my training log, you'd know how hard I work to stay thin. Cardio every day, weightlifting, an exceedingly strict diet that started with black coffee in the morning and ended with a single piece of fruit at night. It was grueling, but it seemed like every voice around me said that if you were a formerly fat person, you had no choice. But that overheard conversation between Sarah and Rebecca haunted me for weeks. I took a long look at the woman I'd married, and suddenly things started to click into place. Her internet search history, sprinkled with puzzling terms like SSBHM and belly play. The ponderous men she stared at when she thought I wasn't looking. Character actors she liked, her way of pressing homemade baked goods on everyone, and dozens of other tiny clues that made her preference head-slappingly obvious. Frankly, I felt like an idiot for not realizing it before. 
And every time she left the house to go to a guitar lesson, I noticed how her eyes sparkled, and I burned with jealousy. For a while, I considered asking her to switch teachers, but when I thought about it more, that wasn't the real issue. At some point, a split-screen vision appeared in my head. On one side, me leaving our warm bed at 5.30 a.m. to go to the gym, and on the other, Sarah and I snuggled together on the couch while she fed me fresh-baked cookies. All of a sudden, the solution seemed both obvious and elegant, and it flooded me with happy, nervous excitement. I sat down and made a list of every food I had longed for and not eaten for over a decade. I inaugurated the project by bringing a gallon of vanilla ice cream and all the toppings for a sundae into the living room and sat on the couch where Sarah could see me from her practice area. I opened the ice cream, covered it with toppings, and ate until they, and the top layer of the ice cream, were gone. Then I added the toppings again and ate the next layer. I could gauge Sarah's reaction by her playing, which was full of drop notes and two long pauses, and I was giddily positive she was distracted by my pig out. Finally, I assumed she couldn't stand it anymore. She blurted, You're eating ice cream? Yes. I replied through a mouthful of hot fudge. I just had this craving. He just had this craving, he said. He claimed to have hurt his back and stopped going to the gym. Temporarily, he evaded. But weeks and weeks went by and his gym bag gathered dust by the door. And what's weirder, he started having little, well, no huge picnics in front of the TV while I was practicing. Practicing horribly, I might add, since I was completely distracted watching him gobble a growing array of desserts. When we ate dinners together, he seemed ravenous and asked sweetly for his thirds and fourths of everything. So I cooked more and made the portions bigger. He started doing our grocery shopping, and things I wasn't used to appeared in our kitchen. Butter, sugar, flour and items he called goodies, which could mean anything from bacon to a giant sampler of chocolates. And I loved the change. But I didn't say a word for fear that he'd get spooked and run back to steamed veggies and the treadmill. He was still relatively thin, but a telltale paunch started to form, and sometimes, as I watched him sleep, I'd look at his body to see if I could see him grow bigger. It's hard to tell when you see someone all the time. One day, after all this had been going on for a few months, my car started to have issues, so I borrowed Joel's SUV. I climbed in and smelled fast food, and realized the floor of the back seat was covered with empty wrappers from different burger, taco and pizza joints. I opened the glove compartment and a waterfall of chocolate bars fell out, along with a notebook labeled training log. Out of curiosity, I opened it to the most recent entry, assuming it would be from when he was still working out. But my jaw dropped. His last entry was from the previous day. A list of foods that would make a glutton blush, plus calorie counts, plus current weight, two or three. I flipped backwards and there were measurements, weights, progress pictures. He had put on about 50 pounds in the past few months, a number that made my stomach flip. He seemed to be purposely gaining weight. For me? My heart thudded in my chest and my pussy grew wet. I replaced everything in the glove compartment, unbuttoned my jeans, slid one hand into my panties and rubbed my clit while thinking of Joel's potential, how big it could be in a year, two years, five years. I'd seen pictures of him from high school, so I knew he could eat. Zach who? I celebrated to myself while standing on the scale. I was up to 296 and incredibly pleased with my burgeoning corpulence. I snapped a picture from my training log and marveled that while once upon a time I had hated having breasts, a spare tire, hanging well over my waistband, and a growing flabbiness about my arms and legs, I now felt like a sex god. I had put on almost 150 pounds. Although she still went to guitar lessons occasionally, Sarah spent much less time practicing and more time cooking for me and making her appreciation for my growing body obvious. Before I started gaining, we'd fallen into something of a sex rut. Now that she was following the swaying of my ever softer, ever wider ass up the stairs every night, Sarah wanted me all the time. The funny thing is that neither of us acknowledged what was happening outright. Somewhere along the line, we'd both grown used to speaking in looks, in implications, in code. 
It was a game to see how far we could push it. One evening close to my birthday, we were sitting in front of the TV and I was washing down a bag of chips with a pitcher of milkshake. Sarah cleared her throat. Joel, what size are you? Her voice studiously casual. Why do you ask? I volleyed. She looked bemused. Because I was hoping to buy you some clothes for your birthday, but I wasn't sure if the sizes I bought you last year would fit. Last year's pants wouldn't make it past my thighs, and she knew it. Well, I have put on a couple pounds, I drastically understated. Maybe you should measure me and see. Sarah's eyes got huge. She scrambled to find a tape measure. When she returned, I stood up but kept shoveling handfuls of chip crumbs into my mouth as she pulled the tape measure around my waist. For a second, I wasn't sure if it would make it, but the ends just barely lapped. 58, she cooed, smiling from ear to ear as she wound the tape measure. I swallowed. I hadn't taken measurements in a while, and realizing that I'd added 20-some inches to my waist in the last couple years was a shock. Huh. What waist size did you buy last year? Uh, 46, she guessed. Ah, I sputtered. In that case, maybe get something that leaves me some room to grow. And a second tape measure, too, I imagine, she mused. It wasn't long before we were upstairs in bed. Just before I entered her, I made a point of lifting my belly out of the way, and she gasped with delight. Christmas, a couple years after Joel started gaining, we flew to Denver to visit my sister Rebecca, her husband Phil, and my nieces for a few days. Rebecca hadn't seen Joel since he was still thin, and I was dying to hear what she'd say when she opened the door Christmas Eve and saw him, pushing 350 pounds and gloriously rotund. But other than a quick look of surprise, her reaction was pretty muted. Little did I know she was saving it up for when we were alone. After Christmas dinner, Rebecca was washing dishes and I was drying. We worked in silence until she grinned and teasingly said, Oh, P.S. Have I mentioned that I hate you? I guffawed. What? I said, mock innocent. Um, how is your life so charmed? You got the good hair, good skin, great job, and the only fly in the ointment was that your super handsome sweet husband was too fit. Poor you, she mimed, playing the word smallest violin and I collapsed into a fit of giggles. And then you show up this year and is fat enough to play Santa without any padding? You know he ate so much at dinner that I have no leftovers? Also, that sweater we bought him is about a zillion sizes too small. She flicked the water at me, pretend annoyed. I blushed and ducked my head. Sorry. She pursed her lips and looked at me. So... I mean, it's not my thing, but are you happy? Deliriously, I gushed. I honestly can't keep my hands off him. So I noticed, she yelled. That guest bed you're sleeping on is very squeaky. I had to tell the girls some outrageous lie that you two were wrapping presents when they asked about all the noise. I clapped the hand to my mouth as the previous night flashed through my mind. I'd gotten so turned on by watching Joel finish off cookies and eggnog that I pounced on him, riding his cock vigorously as he begged me to be gentle with his very big, very full belly. The squeaky bed hadn't even occurred to me. Becca, I'm so sorry, why didn't you ever tell me about the bed before? A furtive smile crossed her face. Well, Sarah, you weren't such a crazed animal before, it wasn't an issue. She took the dish towel out of my hands. Now I feel like a bad host. Go have fun. I'll get the girls to watch a movie and turn it up real loud. She might have been kidding, but I wasn't about to turn down that offer. Later, as Joel skillfully fingered me while I kneaded his blubbery belly with one hand, I bit my lips to keep from squealing with joy. While I did enjoy the flirtatious quality of how we hadn't directly addressed my deliberate weight gain, our little games and evasions, I was dying to have it out in the open. I wanted to know when she put two and two together, 
and wanted to be free to brag to her about exactly how big I'd gotten. And then, like magic, the opportunity presented itself. One night we were discussing what to have for dinner. I have a craving for tacos, I mused. You just had tacos yesterday. You must have a thing about them this week, she said offhandedly, and a bell went off in my head. I'd snuck through the Taco Bell drive through while running errands and never told her about it. So how did she know? I hadn't told anyone except... And then the clouds parted. Of course. The training log. No wonder she didn't ask more questions. That sly minx had all the information she wanted. God, how many times she must have paged through that little book when I wasn't around. The next morning I thought about it and lazed in bed while she took a shower. I heard the telltale sign of the showerhead switching from rainfall to pulse, which only ever meant one naughty thing. The lady of the house was pleasuring herself. Inspiration struck, and I grabbed the training log out of my bedside drawer. I ambled to the bathroom, opened the shower door, pressed my lips to her ear, and recited. Breakfast. Six egg omelet with cheese. Bacon. Three bananas. Pitcher of orange juice. Mid-morning snack, five donuts. Lunch, foot-long sub, family-sized bag of chips, two liters of soda. Afternoon snack, one pan of brownies with milk. Dinner, two steaks, one mixing bowl of mashed potatoes with gravy, one bottle of red wine. Dessert, one cheesecake. Her breathing was fast and shallow. The hand pointing the shower head at her clitoris worked busily. Weight, I continued, 414 pounds. She threw her head back, and a high, sweet noise escaped her as she came. Eventually, she exhaled, shook her head, and smiled broadly at me. Busted, she conceded. Get in here if there's room for you, she growled, grabbing one of my love handles. Are you having an affair? My co-worker Tina asked me point blank over lunch in the cafeteria. No, good lord, did someone tell you I was? I was stunned. Tina narrowed her eyes. You float around the office humming all day, your skin's glowing and you're all short skirts and high heels like you want to impress someone. If it's not an affair, tell me what it is, cause I want some. I don't even recall what I said in response, I'm sure it was lame and unconvincing. But I took her point, I'd been in a lust fog for months. Especially since Joel and I had begun to talk openly about his weight gain and how it excited me. I'd had no idea what delights we were missing before. He had a story for me every day that pointed up how much bigger he was. Like trying to squeeze his vast bottom into a chair at the barber shop, or realizing his fat pants from a few months ago would no longer button or sip. For my part, I was thrilled to get to tell him every day how gorgeous he'd grown. I loved to sing the praises of his belly, which hung to mid-thigh as he rounded the corner of 500 pounds and kept packing on weight. He let me carry his training log around with me, because when I looked at his progress pictures and saw him inflate from an ordinary thin guy to a man so breathtakingly corpulent that people stared as he waddled down the street, I wanted him more than ever. I'm sure circle of friends didn't know what to think. They were too polite to mention that Joel had gotten so out of shape he could hardly walk from the car to someone's front door without being too winded to speak. Even when we were at the friend's house and Joel's chair splintered beneath him when he sat on it, the hostess simply mumbled, Oh, these chairs are no good, discreetly, not mentioning that Joel weighed double their maximum capacity. The incident didn't face Joel anyway. Once seated on something sturdier, he proceeded to eat more than the rest of us combined. And I loved that he would be such a pig in front of our friends. Sometimes, at those dinner parties, if we were on the less visible side of the table, he'd quietly unzip his pants, let his belly flow out, and place my hand on it to feel how full he was. On those nights, I'd make any excuse to leave just after dessert, because it was either that or say the hell with propriety and just do him under the dining room table. I ran into my old trainer at Starbucks. We'd always had a good relationship. He had also lost a lot of weight as a kid, and we used to bond over the difficulty of keeping it off, and how much it sucked to eat rabbit food all the time. Since I stopped working out with him, we'd exchanged some hey, how are you emails. 
and I alluded to gaining some weight, but I didn't exactly come out and say, yeah, I'm almost 550 pounds, and the only exercise I get is shoveling food in my mouth and getting tackled a couple times a day by my extremely amorous wife. So I was amazed he recognized me, but sure enough, I turned around with my extra-large mochaccino, and he exclaimed, Joel? Trevor, how's it going? I said uneasily. He looked like a P90X model, and of course I'd worn a shirt that was too small and clung to my rolls upon rolls of belly and back fat. I realized I had more than tripled in size since I saw him last. We both sat down at a table outside, and I was conscious of my ass substantially overflowing my chair. Jesus, dude, I'd heard rumors you got big, but I had no idea, he shook his head. What happened? He and I had been close before, and I'd been dying to brag to another guy about all this, so out it came. You won't believe this, but my wife asked me to stop dieting and working out. Turns out she prefers me... chubby. Trevor cocked an eyebrow. Okay, whale-like, I conceded, laughing. His breath came out in a sharp burst. You lucky bastard. I thought women like that were an urban legend, and you married one? He shook his head. God, I'm jealous. And she lets you eat whatever you want? Dude, I leaned into him as much as my bulk would allow. Not just that, she makes it for me. The other night, she made me something she called cake soup. You know what that is? A gallon of ice cream and a cake whipped together in a mixer until it's like, well, soup. Then she fed it to me, and then... I sat back, put my hands behind my head, and let him draw his own conclusions about what delightful thing Sarah had done to me next. He shook his head in wonder. I shouldn't say this, and if you repeat it to anyone at the gym, I'll deny it. But you're living the dream, man. Have a slice of pizza for me. As he walked to his car, I snickered to myself at the idea of just eating one slice of pizza. That poor guy. Towards the end of my most recent lesson, I strummed the last chord of Eleanor Rigby. Looked at the clock and realized I needed to get a couple of batches of cream puffs in the oven if I wanted to feed them to Joel before dinner. Which I very much did. Zach, can we cut this a little short? I just realized I need to get home and get something in the oven. Sure, Zach agreed, putting down his guitar. Hey, did Joel tell you I saw him a few weeks ago at 7-Eleven? That had to have been a shock. Zach hadn't seen Joel in over two years, and at the time Joel had been a comparatively swelled 380 pounds. Oh, he didn't mention it. I almost didn't recognize him, he's gotten... Zach trailed off politely. Uh, I think humongous is the word you're looking for, I giggled. Yeah, you might say he fell off his diet and never looked back. We had a weird conversation though, Zach's brow furrowed. You know, there was the usual, hey, how's it going, nice weather, blah, blah. And then he asked me how much I weigh. Oh, I froze. I hardly ever tell anyone, but I figured he wasn't exactly in a position to be judgy. No offense. So I told him. He dropped his voice. 440, you know. And then he kind of chuckled and said, well, I guess I win. And he left. What was that about? I smiled and shook my head. Joel had gained an entire sack and then some. To my complete ecstasy, there was just over 600 pounds of Joel, waddling from bed to fridge to bed these days. I have no idea, I lied. We also wanted to take this time to thank Butterfly Blob, our Patreon backer, for supporting this episode. If you guys want to support us as well and maybe make some more elaborate projects happening, you're, wel you're welcome to do so on our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash h4m, but all the links, as always, are in the description. 
Other than that, if you want to get in touch with us, you can find me as Tender Loving Cares on Phoebe and on Fembrosia. You can find my Tumblr as tenderlovingcares.tumblr.com where I post little updates. And you can always visit the website, which is hungrymagazine.com, where I have both the magazine and the previous podcast episodes online. So you can go check them out. And where can they find you, Pizza Wolf? Uh, well, I'm mainly uh, mainly findable on Phoebe. We're on Pizza Wolf on Phoebe. That's That's basically where I tend to limit most of my interaction with uh, the internet pedism scene. So if you find me on Phoebe, just say hey. Okay, so hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, Check out the playlist and we'll see you next week. Bye! See you next week. Bye-bye!